final session of Advancing Inclusive Leadership at the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School. This has been a historic conversation that promises to shape a new history on inclusion and diversity in leadership and in corporate America. Recalling a world at war, the United Nations Secretary General told heads of state gathered together to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. He said, this is our 1945 moment. He was referencing the world that was at war in 1945. But I like to think of this moment as our Nuremberg moment, a time of global reckoning, a time for justice, when we correct the great wrongs of our history and of our past. And to summon the spirit of Justice Jackson, I would like to think that we are at a moment when we are able to correct the wrongs which we seek to condemn so that they cannot survive, they are being repeated. So how can we ensure that the wrongs of the past of racial and gender injustice, racial and gender bias, racial and gender systemic wrongs are not repeated? So what are these wrongs that, that they are not be repeated. After all the terrible headlines about harassment in Silicon Valley, after all the Me Too stories, after all the well-meaning efforts, such as the Decency Pledge, the percentage of funding to women-led companies by venture capitalists actually fell in 2018. It fell from a meager 2.3 to a 2.53 in 2018. And this is despite the fact that research shows that women-owned firms fail less frequently than male-owned firms and are typically more capital efficient. We also have the research from McKinsey that gender equality around the world can generate up to $28 trillion. This is more than the GDP of China and the US brought together. Of the 85 billion invested by venture capital, only 1.9 billion go to women-led teams, which means over 89% of the venture funds go to all men-led teams. So what we see here are the statistics that show the wrongs of the past, the stories that women and men and women of color share with us on the wrongs of history, there are no repetition. So my questions to our esteemed leaders gathered here at this final panel are really hard questions because I'm looking finally for hard solutions. So how, and these questions are drawn from the conversation that we've been engaged in in the last four days. How can women and women of color break into the big boys club, the old boys club? How can we adopt a version of the NFL's Rooney Rule, which ensures that there is diversity represented at every level in a company or in a law firm? How can we ensure that there are mentors, supporters, as well as sponsors who take a leap of faith on an individual who does not look like you? And then finally, how do you ensure that the rhetoric and the grand rhetoric has been extremely impressive and inspiring? Firms and corporations are rushing to make pledges to address systemic bias and systemic racism and to right the wrongs of the past. But how can we ensure that this rhetoric is translated into practice? So I want to start by looking at some of the ways in which you, in some of the hallowed halls of corporate America, and as entrepreneurs, as leaders in corporations, are ensuring that we right these wrongs. So I'm going to start with Peter. Peter Rabley is an entrepreneur, a business leader, and a technologist. 
He's also a partner at Omidya Network. And for those of you who do not know about the Omidya Network, it was started by Pierre Omidya, the founder of eBay. So Peter is really instrumental in ensuring inclusion and diversity at Omidya Network, not just in its composition, but the way in which its work, philanthropic work, ensures a more equal world. So Omidya Network, Peter, recently uh, pledged over $150 million to address uh, COVID-19 pandemic-related inequalities. And some of the recipients are those who are really ensuring a more equal world, including the Roosevelt in, uh, Institute, the Free Press Action Fund. So can you tell us more, Peter, about the ways in which you envision a more equal world that rights the wrong history through your work at Omidya, but also your work as an entrepreneur and leader? Yes, thank, thank you, Rangita, and it's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be here on the call with everyone. Um, obviously, uh, the, the topics are huge, uh, and uh, you know, all the money in the world, frankly, is, is, is probably not going to, uh, to, to solve all of the problems. So we, of course, like any impact investor and any investor, we have to try and decide how we can best leverage the monies that we have available to us, which are not insignificant, but still um, we have to be targeted in how we think about deploying those resources. And I think one of the ways that we have always thought about this is to try and um, prime the pump. So we actually have a, a short paper on this idea of priming the pump, meaning can we invest high risk funding that we're, we have at our, um, available uh, to us in areas that others are not willing to invest because either it doesn't bring uh, the market type of return or they claim that the, the deal flow is not there um, and therefore there's there's no way to place their well-intentioned funds if, if they were. So part of the way you deal with a systemic failure is you say we have to take a long view, we have to invest in things others will not invest in. And our success is defined by almost preparation of those uh, willing to step out front and start organizations or companies and bring them along to the, prepare them for the point at which they might get more traditional support and, uh, and capital. Um, and so that's a, a lens by which we try and approach how we invest or provide organizations with funding and money. And it's not easy because one of the criteria that you always look for, of course, which can be self-defeating, is how long has the organization been around and will they sustain themselves and so forth. So, you know, part of it is taking that leap of faith that we have to make that investment. Uh, we are lucky in that we have been given capital that we are allowed to put at risk, if you will, or be incredibly patient. Um, and that's a privilege to have that sort of resource with us. The other thing we do more tactically as well is um, deploy what we would refer to as network and intellectual capital. And this comes out of our operating expense budget and is made available to us to pay for and provide additional services beyond the capital itself to grow the organization. So whether that's mentoring assistance and board recruitment, uh, training, um, staff development, uh, development of, of procedures and policies, of back office accounting systems, uh, and then through network capital, co connecting them with others that might have been a little further ahead in, in the journey of deploying diversity and, and so forth. And I'll just finish with a quick idea that um, a wonderful professor that we supported at the University of Baltimore, who have a law school, who have been running a program for the last 20 years, and, and the thing that he always told me that has just lived with, I've lived with was the idea of how far back one has to reach to bring someone forward to the point at which, say, I enjoy my life and my world around me because of the investment made over my entire lifetime by everyone around me. Um, and the idea that it's not just access 
to a scholarship fund to attend the University of Baltimore. It is so much more culturally, um, uh, historically support, mentoring, psychology, and so forth in order to bring someone forward into this world that we sort of inhabit and take for granted. And, and I just had a conversation recently with a very, very successful a female African entrepreneur who's considered absolutely one of the best and sits on some major corporate boards international, who in fact told me that that story resonated with her as recently as last week. And this is someone with a Harvard degree, et cetera, et cetera, who said at the table she was put at, she didn't feel that she belonged because of who she was surrounded by, despite everything that she had that would appear on the surface to be said that she has made it into this world that we're trying to bring everyone else into. And so it was a reminder that if she still felt that way, um, just how much this is a constant uh, job for all of us. So Peter, those were real concrete sessions to address this institutional and systemic change level. These are real, um, what I would say, uh, structural issues that you have brought to bear. Some of the root causes of the problem and how do we address the root causes. And just very quickly to conceptualize what you said, invest in what others do not invest in. In other words, take a leap of faith. Invest in those that do not, um, to some extent, be a part of your own history or who do not look like you. Second, the intellectual capital, and that's more powerful and valuable than the, the, than the, the financial capital because you're really talking about giving a person an institution that needs the kind of uh, equal playing field that it did not inherit. So, that intellectual capital, including mentoring, and the cultural change. So that, that sense of belonging, even when you're at the table, the sense of belonging at the table by the club is so important, so pervasive. And how do we address that? Addressing that calls for more of the kind of work that you're doing, Peter. It's not only about me, the money is important, but how do we provide? mentoring, the opportunities, the sponsorship, and the cultural change. So thank you, Peter, for those ideas, and I want this conversation. So Kamakshi, you are almost always the only woman and the only woman of color in a room full of tech entrepreneurs. You are an entrepreneur, you are a founder, you are a technology, you are a scholar, you drop to the coil in Microsoft. And probably one of the most powerful women in Italy who has built her G driven startup. This is a making a distinction between a technology driven startup, and those other startups that are not driven by the engineers. You have often said, Kamakshi, that your role is to ensure that the future of work is female. And you have also said Silicon Valley has a diversity problem. So what are your recommendations? And I want you to feed off what Peter said. You know, Peter has said it's more than money. And you've talked about it too, that you've had lots of funders willing to invest in you financially, but you needed that kind of support to be able to infiltrate the old boys network in Silicon Valley. So building on Peter's conversation on cultural change, and the importance of intellectual capital. Can you tell us what worked for you? Um, really thoughtful comments uh, from Peter. And thank you so much, Ranjita, for a, creating a forum for such an you know, important conversation and bringing together leaders who are at the forefront of not simply conversing on the topic, but actually actioning on that. Uh, I will probably share more an experiential point of view um, uh, hopefully that kind of gives um, some credence to some of the points that Peter just talked about and so far as taking a chance and making investments and taking bets on people and areas that are otherwise underserviced from, you know, the traditionally sort of well-measured market return rates, if you may. 
Um, so my experience, uh, as you correctly pointed out, Ranjita, being an engineer technologist, I have been used to the fact that I'm one among the very few women in the room, in the audience, whether it was in my undergrad, graduate school education, my PhD program at Stanford. Um, and, and something that, that I forgot to, can, I want you to pause for a minute because this is very important. Your work is used at NASA. How many women and how many women of color can boast about their product, their, uh, their brain work, the brainchild of their research being used by NASA. So I just wanted to make sure people knew that. Well, thank you so much, Vinjita. Uh, that's true, indeed. In fact, my, my involvement in the space mission called New Horizons, which was one of the, I, I believe until recently, the most expensive mission NASA had to the outer planetary system, uh, including the Kuiper Belt objects and uh, Pluto, which was then a planet, but was demoted and then promoted and it's still in this transition state. Uh, uh, so the work that I built was on board the spacecraft. So this experience of being one among the very few women, uh, I remember an experience I had to be escorted uh, um, to the bathroom when I was uh, working on the NASA mission. There were just not enough women. So men had to escort me to the bathroom because I'm, I'm in sort of, you know, JPL facilities and it is, you're escorted everywhere around. Uh, so that's kind of the story I, I've, I've been comfortable with that I'm, I've never found a, personally, given the years of living this life, I've never felt so much discomfort in being in this reality. In spite of that, going into the venture world, starting a business of your own, raising venture capital, being in a room full of partners and being sort of you know, the one woman there, especially the one colored woman there, the one colored woman technologist there who doesn't sound or look like the remaining people in the room and yet having the confidence to be able to sort of get your story across and get your pitch across and be able to command the room. And because confidence is a big part of the sales story for raising capital and to, to be able to have that and do that for the first time. I'm a, I was a first time entrepreneur when I raised um, six and a half million as the first series A round with uh, Sequoia Capital and Kleiner Perkins. And I was in a room full of like 20 partners. And literally this was like seven years back, there was not one woman in the partnership there. In Kleiner Perkins, there was one woman, but in Sequoia, there was not even one woman in the partnership there. Um, so that's the kind of experience. And the reason I'm sharing the story is I'm saying that women who are seasoned uh, and, and comfortable in living in these environments of so you know extreme skews find it challenging when you have to when you're putting when you put in this environment that's completely new and many people do not have the confidence to transition to that and they withdraw from that from that from from even getting to that stage and that's you know many a time argued and talked about as a i don't know as a supply problem and that's where I think some of the points that Peter talked about really resonated with me that, you know, whether it is the mentor, it's one thing to start mentorship post having funded and financed the company or the entrepreneur. It's an entirely other thing to basically create an environment where enough women feel that they are, that there is comfort to even go there and participate in these conversations. Uh, many times women tend to self select themselves into funds or groups where they find this and, and comfort many times will be mistaken to be this kind of, you know, fuzzy soft trait. It is not, it is extremely important so that your heart traits, heart technology traits can shine through. Otherwise you're limiting yourself. So this comfort is not a soft issue that should be sort of, you know, set aside. So many times self-selection happens and you're not even given the best chance to participate in the, you know, among the best of the best in the best of the funds. And, and, and that's sort of some of the issues, I think from a mentorship perspective, I feel that it's one thing to start post-financing. It's another thing to be able to create an environment of enablement for women to participate even sooner. And one other sort of point that comes across is many times when we talk about entrepreneurship uh, among women, and I I'm speaking from a technologist sort of lens, and pardon my, uh, my characterization here, but it comes from my own personal experience. Um, 
I've seen a lot of examples of successful women entrepreneurship and, you know, kudos to women who do that. Um, many times it happens uh, uh, a lot in the, sort of the consumer sector. My ask is, um, especially coming as, you know, an engineer, I would like more women participation in hardcore technologies. Um, at your point about, you know, women uh, uh, led companies, whether it's at the board or at the you know, management level, I have all kinds of favorable statistics on how capital is deployed, how success is created and how successful outcomes are delivered to investors. I'd like to see women participation in STEM engineering technology fields where it's not just consumer companies that women found create and create success out of, but it's also hardcore technologies that women create success out of. And that is something I personally, you know, I experience, but I would like more women to participate in that as well. So mentorship, even in the, with the lens of STEM and engineering and technology is something that I want to participate. I'm creating my own sort of network participation at various levels. And I hope to be able to bring like-minded people along with me and along the way. So on that, on that comment on like-minded people, and because you've always shared with me the fact that you've often been the only woman entrepreneur in the room, the only woman of color entrepreneur in the room, and the only woman of color hardcore technologist in the room, because that's a big distinction that you just pointed out, you know, hardcore engineer from the STEM area in the room. I have for you another woman, a woman of color entrepreneur and a hardcore technologist, Dr. Geetanjali Swami, who received her engineering PhD from Berkeley with us. She was recently voted one of the top 10 most influential women in technology. She is a serial entrepreneur and she, like you, Kamakshi, has as a vision and a mission to build a new generation of women in hardcore technology and women of color who are able to assume this mantle of leadership and entrepreneurship and in building technology. Gitanjali, Gitanjali, what I want you to Great. do is, I would like to see you. Are you able to join yeah, us? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm having a little bit of uh, video problems because I'm in a relatively poor coverage area, but I'm hoping you can hear me, right? I can hear you very well. I can hear you Fantastic. very well, and you can Fantastic. hear us and see us? Yes, I can. So, okay. Uh, so my question to you, so my question to you is something you and I have often discussed. When men pitch startups, they get asked how they will make money. But when women get uh, pitched, they're asked how they'll prevent losing investors' money. And those <laughs> questions, those questions can have a direct impact on how much funding they may receive. So this is something you always shared with me. Can you address that and the larger issues that Kamakshi and Peter addressed? Yeah, and let me start by saying, and I think this is a really important point, inclusion comes from inside. And I think this is really important because sometimes, and actually more often than not, we get caught up in the externalities of the differences between us and that's sort of where we sort of miss the point. Um, you know, what I found that that notion of recognizing someone who is like-minded, like irrespective of what kind of packaging they come in, is actually important. Now, some of my best friends and mentors have been men, wonderful men, right? But part of the reason why we were actually given the opportunity to become good friends and uh, colleagues was because on both sides, there was this ability to recognize the person in sight, like-minded soul, and not get caught up with the externalities of who we are, right? Um, and I think that, you know, that's sort of the micro phenomena and what it translates down into is a macro phenomena where we do not really address diversity and inclusion in sight. You know, there's a lot of marketing, people get on panels, they make pledges, but then we wonder why it doesn't show up in statistics. And the reason it doesn't show up in, the, in statistics is we're not addressing the inside. And that's a very important point. 
you have to address the value system, the comfort, because a lot of these decisions are, you know, believe it or not, emotional ones, where people don't believe uh, internally that someone who doesn't look like them could be just as effective as them. So, you know, I want to point to two different initiatives which are actually geared towards um, addressing this business of looking at it holistically, looking at the inside as much as we look at the outside. One of them is this new investor assessment tool that we're piloting as part of the UN Equals. Uh, in fact, coincidentally, this month we're running the pilot where we are basically opening it up to select investors to take. So if you think you're a gender equitable investor and you believe that you have a best practice, um, you know, we invite you to take that investor self-assessment tool. And then in November 1st, we're going to do a large scale rollout. But, you know, this, this self-assessment points to that whole issue that getting on panels, making pledges, all of those are external facing. You really have to change the way you do your day to day. Um, and I think this is going to be very eye-opening because it'll address the fact that, you know, the fact that we are post, you know, hashtag Me Too, and yet this year's State of Women in Tech and Startups reports that 44% of women entrepreneurs claim that they have been sexually harassed, um, you, know, and, uh, you know, while they have been fundraising, right? So, you know, the question is, how come we're making all this noise, we're making all these pledges and there isn't any change? And I think it's because we're not addressing the internal. So, um, you know, that's number one. It, number two, and I think this is also an equally important point, we really have to do things at scale. And when I talk about scale, this is really important because, you know, we always point to one token woman and then we say, ah, yes, the problem solved. Look, we've got a token, right? And nothing embodies this better than looking at you know, today's Supreme Court hearings. I know I have enough friends who are conservatives who say, well, it's our women. What's the problem with it? You people are not supporting women because, hey, you're not supporting another woman that's, you know, a candidate here, right? Um, and I think that's the other big issue, that tokens are not going to solve this problem. You really have to look at this at large scale. And to that end, I'd like to point to an effort at UC Berkeley as part of the um, uh, Witty at UC initiative that I co-founded uh, with uh, Dean uh, Sujay King Liu on really looking at the problems of women in tech in a very um, you know, scale manner. One of the things that we have been proposing this year is to look at doing the equivalent of a Manhattan project on diversity and inclusion, where we look at all the different investments incubators that the university, the UC system, and you know, uh, run an RCT trial to see what methods, what interventions actually work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think that's the you know second aspect. That is, this needs to be done at scale. So I think that we need to really take a pivot here and start looking at these two things. One, looking at it inside, figure out what makes a person inclusive, what makes an organization inclusive. And two, start thinking at scale. Let's not fall into the trap of looking for a few tokens and somehow justifying that as our progress in uh, diversity and inclusion. So those are extremely important pillars that you've talked about, that it's something that happens uh, uh, not externally but internally and second the ways in which you are creating these metrics to measure inclusion and diversity but I do want to go back to the point that Peter and Karmakshi spoke about which is something that Sujay King Liu the the dean of uh, your alma mater Berkeley engineering spoke on the first day when she joined our conversation she said that when she was looking to hire and appoint faculty at Berkeley Engineering, she found that the letters of recommendation, that the language was different when making a reference for a woman scientist as against a male scientist, that there was more often rising star, you would describe a male engineer as against a female engineer. 
So I think we need to be also conscious about those externalities, the external framings and the language that define and reinforce those biases, Geetanjali. So very quickly, I'm going to ask Peter to respond to what Kamakshi and Geetanjali said, because I think it's very important. Peter, you provide the funding and here, you know, we have Kamakshi and Geetanjali who are the engineers and the entrepreneurs of startups looking for venture capital. Oh, thanks, Rangita. Yeah, and I mean, it's um, in some ways it's good, but it's unfortunate to hear some of the points we're trying to address in the structural way uh, being repeated through lived experience of Kamachi uh, and, and others. Um, I, and I would say that for us, it, it goes just beyond uh, agenda uh, inclusion as well. Uh, more often than not, we're looking at investing in frontier markets, emerging markets. And so extending on that is um, I might be able to find possibly with some hard work, a qualified uh, female uh, led hard science organization to fund. I'm going to definitely struggle for that in Africa um, for other structural reasons. Um, and so how you know, we've, we've always been faced and challenged with when we enter new geographies and new cultures, different levels of um, challenges around equality. Um, indigenous tribes, and so one of the areas that we had focused on is indigenous people and bringing uh, the rights to uh, the resources and, and the land that they work and live on. Um, how do we engage with those organizations, those communities, who um, their way of being included is to have a structural environment that doesn't fit with the outside statutory world. And, and so the inclusion for us reaches even down into that point and would, would actually be relevant to say Native Americans who signed treaties that was completely out of a power imbalance and signed to statutory environments that they simply didn't have in their notions of culture and governance. And uh, so when, when we challenge people and say Native Americans, there's a need for reparations and people say, well, they signed treaties and they knowingly signed treaties and they gave up those rights. But that was never true and never fair because of the gross imbalance in power and the structures and forms of governance that were coming at it. So, not to sort of throw fuel on the fire, but as to say that we go so far as to extend this idea of inclusion and diversity uh, well beyond just gender, which is of course critical, but to these other facets and elements, um, which are almost even foundational in their, in their nature. And I, I don't have any clear answers other than to say, you have to identify them, you have to work on them, and you have to really put a lot of ideas aside in order to engage, say, with an indigenous community, just because of how different that lived world and experience is. Absolutely, and I'm so glad that you brought up the importance of uh, different forms of diversity, whether it is gender, race, ethnicity, the underrepresentation of these voices in decision making. And often what we find is that uh, the bottom of the pyramid happen to be these intersectional uh, groups, whether it's a woman from an indigenous tribe or a woman from Mongolia who is in a frontier province who has had no opportunities to go to school, unlike her brother. So Kamakshi, can you speak very quickly about the ways in which, and Gitanjali talked about this uh, women who tech report, which showed that 48% of women entrepreneurs have faced uh, some kind of harassment and 42% of women in technology have uh, experienced harassment. So there are barriers other than funding that exclude women in hard sciences. So Kamakshi, in your own uh, experience, you have talked about and very powerfully about the cultural barriers that you have overcome. Those cultural barriers uh, were very familiar. You know, the culture that you grew up in had a certain vision for a woman of your age. 
and you had to overcome those cultural barriers to get to where you are to uh, to graduate with a phd from stanford in an area that you were one of the first women and so can you speak about those cultural barriers that have that you have transcended sure um uh, by way of sort of very quick uh, my own personal background i come from a fairly lower middle class family uh, i hail from india originally and uh, where there is a very set mold for women uh, in terms of what they choose to do uh, even if they have the right to choose and what is expected out of them the role that they play in society uh, while i had a very sort of you know encouraging and supporting uh, mother and certainly parents they were conformists to sort of the expectations that the society had out of them being members of that society so me breaking the rules by saying that at the age of 20 i'm not getting married and i'm going for my further education to the united states on my own with the $2000 that my father got from his provident fund so that my ticket and other sort of you know initial expenses could be paid off um with uh, literally charting my own future and uh, a lot of which is unknown was extremely unfamiliar to my parents it is not how women behaved and i purposefully choose the word behaved because my mother would tell me that that this is not how women behave women get married and they go with their husband to the place of choice that the husband has and that's kind of the supporting role that and support cast that my role was and uh, not only that from from that to sort of going to a phd program that was also unheard of not just that from that to sort of you know not taking a role in a corporate mnc uh, after my phd program but actually taking a role in a startup that was relatively unknown of at that time then being acquired by google and then leaving google within a year to go start my own company uh, none of this was recognizable and many times I would get asked by my own parents who unarguably were very supportive and despite all the discomfort that they would feel through all my decisions, uh, they, they would ask these questions. I, I just don't know how to help you because everything that you do is so unknown to us. So this, this point that you said, Ranjita, about sort of, there is a lot of, you know, uh, I, I think Gitanjali also talked about sort of the internal external. And if you bring it down to sort of the micro individual internal external, I think, because there is so much, uh, I think Peter mentioned this, you have to go back in time a lot before you are able to kind of bring people back up to a level playing field. Uh, if you think about generations and generations for, from a women's perspective, I think you have to go back in time a lot. And that's sort of, I think that internal external barrier that you know people like me who are arguably have far more opportunities than to the to your point, Ranjita, about sort of the woman in the frontier province in Mongolia. I have far more opportunities. I contended with that. So that's why I shudder to think how women who do not have any of these opportunities, the, all the challenges that they go through. And uh, to your point about like some uh, of the questions around harassment and you know how sort of support needs to be brought in, not simply from a one venture fi financing perspective. You know, I was unfortunate or fortunately one among those people who did not experience uh, some of these horror stories that, you know, Gitanjali alluded to <clears throat> and certainly we have uh, read over the years. I was exactly the product of what Gitanjali talked about, a very supportive set of partners at Sequoia and China Perkins who were not supportive because I was a woman who they were supportive because they found merit in sort of the idea and the technology and the product that I was pitching. but at no point did I feel like I was being viewed from a gender perspective. I was very aware and there was a sense of extreme sort of, you know, I would, I would venture to say fear because I didn't recognize anything around me when, when I was, we raised about 75 million in capital through the tenure of the company at every step, every, uh, the bar goes high, higher and higher. And none of it was familiar to me, but at no point was I, did I get a sense that I was being viewed more for my gender rather than for sort of the subject matter of what I brought to the table. I realized that I'm the very, very fortunate minority here. So I want to understand what, I want to be able to participate in everything that went right for me and scale that to Gitanjali's point mm. of everything works at scale. How do we scale that? 
it is indeed true that these horror stories are very much happening in the world around us. Um, from, a, from a bias perspective, I did want to bring sort of another point as well. It is not simply at the time, Ranjita, to your point of raising capital or sort of, you know, the, the enablement environment for women to even participate. Even in the corporate world now, as part of Microsoft, there are ways in which it figures in sort of, you know, different shades and hues and tones. The extent to which I see women participate at the executive table, because there are fewer women there, and the kind of, you know, implicit sort of biases or tones or body language that happens, the number of times what a woman said, it gets repeated without acknowledgement. The number of times eye contact is maintained when the woman speaks at the leadership table. Uh, this happens in so many ways in middle management and lower management uh, grades and cadre as well. And, many and it is disparating to a point where it can result in women opting out of the process. I think we need to talk about this as well. We don't need to talk about just the simply, simply extreme, highly sort of, you know, the high visibility points of financing, venture, entrepreneur, women. But we also need to talk about sort of the middle grade of how we increase participation of women and technology in sort of the corporate world in a fashion where they have an equal setting at the table versus sort of some of these implicit biases that happen. And this is, I, I, don't, I don't mean this as a controversial point. I, do, I truly want to bring this as a point of development. No, so this, in, the, the question of implicit bias has been an integral part of our conversation over the last four days because the implicit biases are so invisible and so insidious that they constitute what in my class we call a thousand paper cuts, death by a thousand paper cuts, because in isolation they're not harmful, but in aggregate they constitute the ways in which women are excluded from the boardrooms, from, the, from a place at the table, from decision making. So the importance of recognizing those almost invisible uh, experiences of implicit and subtle biases is exactly what you've just spoken about. The body language, the ways in which the eye contact changes, the ways in which women then feel that they do not belong at the table is really important and is, does not constitute overt discrimination, but they are even more dangerous because every generation has a different kind of what are, what, Isabel Wilkerson calls in her groundbreaking book, Cast, Cast Protocols. And there are several of us here uh, in this platform who are, who are very familiar with what Cast Protocols are. And I think those Cast, cast Protocols are so baked into the generations of history and form the legacy of discrimination and bias that you know, Peter has been talking about. How do we address that intergeneration history and legacy of inequality, not just through funding, but through changes in culture, through that kind of intellectual capital. So and with I'm that, I am going to spend, sorry, I'm going to spend the last 15 minutes in conversation with our final keynote speaker, Dr. Mahmood Khan. You know, and before I introduce him, I want to again set the stage for this major historic forum on inclusive leadership. It grew out of a conversation on the, the ways in which a mass public reckoning on Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement created the need for a new focus on inclusive leadership but it also draws as its foundational concepts the ways in which in 2019, the very influential business round table pledged to reform the kind of old orthodoxy of Milton Friedman's idea that the purpose of business was primarily profit to a more kind of a compassionate understanding of capitalism and of a purpose-driven leadership and purpose-driven business. Now, far before the 2019 business roundtable understanding of a purpose-driven business, Dr. Mahmood Khan created performance with purpose at Pepsi when he was the vice chair of Pepsi working very closely with the legendary Indra Nui, 
who happens to be one of who who has now stepped down but at that time was one of the few a handful of women of color ceos in the fortune 500 dr mahmood khan was vice chairman um, and the chief innovation officer at pepsi and many of the innovations and many of the sustainability protocols that were adopted at pepsi are due to dr mahmood khan's leadership and his vision of the ways in which a corporation's policies and performance and purpose as well as the mission need to be aligned with sustainability inclusion and diversity and with the sustainable development goals and today dr mahmood khan is the ceo of life biosciences so he brings with us generations and a long history of working on sustainability and on purpose driven leadership and just to share with you a very uh, tiny vignette of a story he shared with me on one of our phone conversations where he said that he was when he was at pepsi he was looking at the entire ecosystem the entire supply chain and the diversity the inclusion the sustainability of the supply chain including looking at who were the women farmers who were growing potatoes whether in africa or in south asia and making sure that they had access to water and access to uh, to, to to toilets and the importance of ensuring that at that kind of high level so dr khan i want you to wrap up this historic conversation that we have been engaging in the last four days on purpose driven business that is adopting a more inclusive and diverse approach to advancing business at a time of great crisis when the dual forces of covid and a mass public reckoning are forcing us to acknowledge the fact that we are a world in crisis and that we need to remake our world in a more equal image dr khan thank you um, truly a pleasure and uh, it was Wonderful uh, and informative for me to listen to um, our other speakers, uh, Kamakshi and uh, Peter uh, and Kitanjali. You know, um, two or three points. First of all, uh, just a minor, Indra and I partnered on this journey. In fact, Indra hired me within a few months of her becoming CEO. Uh, and so this is a wonderful 12 year journey that she and I partnered with. In fact, the term performance with purpose, she coined, I chaired, the global work. Um, so it was really that inspiration. But let me ask us to step back and ask ourselves a couple of points. One is there is no business that can exist and thrive healthily unless the community and society in which it does business is surviving. It's just a matter of time. So this notion that the only th um, you know, mission is, is uh, to support the shareholders. Well, in the long run, that's not a conflict. In fact, it's the same thing. It depends on your time horizon. So if you're gonna think of a business in a 12 or 36 month time horizon, you can you know, withdraw any resources you want and it'll be fine. But if you wanna do this for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, in PepsiCo's case, almost 100 years, you're not gonna survive until you can actually think about this. That's the first. The second uh, point I just want to make is, uh, I guess I'm the non-engineer on this call. There is more to technology than IT and, and engineering. There are other fields of, of STEM. I happen to be coming from molecular biology and medicine and now run a, a company spun out of Harvard in the field of uh, genetics and genetic diseases uh, and aging. So what we have to be thinking about is how do we, you know, get women and people of color in the broadest sense. We don't need to be reminded that the life expectancy and mortality of African-American men in this country, I'm not talking about getting a job, I'm just talking about staying alive, is abysmal. And that's not gender bias, that is a structural issue uh, that African-American men growing up in this country face. The example that you, you raised, um, on the water and toilets actually came about and i think it's informative because it's important for leaders to get out into the field where their businesses are conducted if you sit in the c-suite at headquarters you're not going to find these structural biases and in that example 
a large Asian, South Asian country where we do a lot of business is PepsiCo. We found, uh, I was on a visit and a, a young manager, female manager came up and said, look, you head up sustainability, which includes agriculture, water, energy, it's one of the largest corporations in the world, but I want to tell you about my problem. And she was a manager at a distribution warehouse and one of the only two women at the warehouse. It turned out this warehouse was not ours. It was actually one of our contracting organizations, contractors that distributes for us, and they had no women's toilet. And you can imagine a South Asian country where there is uh, a, a men's toilet, but then nobody had put in a female toilet. So we're not talking about high tech, super sophisticated things here, but the bulk of you think about a distribution curve where biases exist. There are hundreds of millions of people who are biased against, which is not high tech solutions, basic human rights. And in that basic human right example, this woman educated with a university degree managed to get around the problem by not drinking water all day. And so she would actually not drink water all day, get to the end of the day and then go home and drink so she wouldn't have to go to the bathroom. Now, once I learned about that, two things happened. There's of course, I made a few phone calls while I didn't have any reporting oversight, we fixed it. But more importantly is the structural solve, which I wanna talk about. We at PepsiCo at that time had a corporate mandate, which was called a code of conduct. It was PepsiCo's code of conduct, which means every employee had a minimal right for some basic things, including, of course, access to clean water, clean toilets, safe working environment, et cetera, et cetera. I said about bringing together our global leadership team, and I said, look, what will it take for PepsiCo to change all of its global contracts such that every contractor that supplies PepsiCo moving forward will actually have to sign the same code of conduct as a PepsiCo entity. Now that might sound like a simple thing. If you think about the PepsiCo operates in 198 countries, only two countries on the planet it doesn't, and indirectly employs hundreds if not millions of people in its supply chain, by forcing that mandate to shift from just the expectations and rights of employees, but the rights of the employees of our contractors, you have a profound impact for two reasons. One is not only the umbrella widens, but more importantly, even if you are only part of that contractor's business because they're having to change for you, they're gonna to have to change all of their work environment for the work product for all other customers of theirs. The domino effect of that, of course, also follows because other multinationals, when, that, when you raise the bar, others start to need to follow, and then the local players that are of scale start to follow. So you actually cause a domino in the whole ecosystem. So I just wanna put a pledge in here. We have to think about both ends of the spectrum. I, there was a lot of conversation about one end of the spectrum, but there is this massive other end of the spectrum that we have to address. The second point, I'm gonna come back to the top of the so-called hierarchy. When I joined PepsiCo in 2007, the heads of R&D globally at PepsiCo were 100% men, 100% US educated, and 100% engineers. Because the history of the company with processing and engineering at all scale, whether it was agricultural or production or chemical, it was everybody's engineering. I'm not an engineer. I'm the son of an engineer, but I'm not an engineer. I disappointed my father. However, the flip of this was I looked at the business lens. The majority of people who buy PepsiCo products are women, the majority. The second is by far the significant growth of PepsiCo was outside the United States. And so you had product innovation from the biotech of the seeds and plants that we developed. We had our own, of course, molecular biology team, all the way through to packaging, material science, everything else. But all of this was being overseen by a typical historical group. 
Eight years later, of my seven direct reports, four were women, three were men, and half were engineers and half were not engineers. More importantly, over half actually had not got their graduate training in the United States. So I think we have to be careful how we define inclusiveness and how we define diversity. It is diversity of how we look, diversity of culture, diversity in education, diversity of perspective. All those things play in to making a healthy, robust, sustainable business. So coming at it from a global company perspective, I just wanted to perhaps add to that, and, and I'd be happy to drill into other examples, but you know, you raised some examples. I thought I'd re respond to that. We can get into all the other facets of sustainability, but relevant to this conversation, I hope this adds to this. Happy to go any further. So I think this was such a panoramic tour de force of your own work at Pepsi, but Pepsi's own evolving mission statement against the backdrop of a global giant. So I want to spend the next five minutes having Geetanjali, Kamakshi, and Peter engage with you, Dr. Khan, because yes, they are engineers and you are a medically trained scientist. So, but all of you are from the STEM field and these fields have, are inextricably interlinked to the law. The law is a discipline that is multidimensional and is very much uh, 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 aligned with these different disciplines. So I want you to be able to answer some of the questions that Kamakshi, Gitanjali, and Peter posed to you. So I'm gonna start with Gitanjali. Gitanjali, do you have a question for Dr. Khan? Oh, absolutely. And thank you so much for such an incredibly inspiring um, recounting of you know, your experiences at Pepsi. And I, I always feel that global organizations are able to handle diversity better because they're exposed to so much more of it. And they're able to understand that there are so many differences. And this is something I find with my experiences with interacting with the UN is that somehow they are much, it is much easier for them to assimilate differences than it is for organizations which are very local and, um, you know, uh, restricted to certain specific areas. So, uh, but my question is, um, you know, actually, and you alluded to this, uh, relates to balancing and the importance of balancing principle and values in an organization with self-interest. And I, I bring this up because I think when we look at issues like diversity and, and inclusion, and I think the broader issue of collective intelligence, uh, it's actually about a long-term principle and value uh, as it relates to, A, the kind of future and the kind of world we wish to create, and B, why having one that is diverse and inclusive is actually better in the long term. Um, so can you speak a little bit to that balancing act between uh, principle and value and self-interest, which drives a lot of tactical business decisions. And the reason I bring this up, and I, I want to bring this because, because it was, it, you know, really brought home to me uh, when I was, um, I, I've been working for the last couple of years with the Massachusetts Senate in terms of introducing legislation that extends the protections of the uh, harassment and discrimination, uh, that's Title VII, to cover investors. And so one of the takes that we took was to say, we need to cover everybody. I mean, to be, speak to Peter's point, we need to cover everybody. So let's make this inclusive. Let's cover everything, not just gender or uh, race, but let's look at all the other dimensions. And one of the things that fascinated me was that the biggest pushback we got was from women in the venture capital industry. And I remember thinking at that point was this was one of those situations where self-interest trumped the greater principle or value that was here at stake. Um, so if you can speak to how you address that in Pepsi, that would be very wonderful. Great, so Dr. Khan, you will have the last words in this historic conversation that we've been engaging in the last four days. So I want you to be mindful that your conversation, your last comments will draw to a close this conversation. 
that I think will have enormous impact globally. Um, Gitanjali, thank you for that question. Um, very profound question. And I'm gonna give you a public example of the dis conversation that happened around PepsiCo One. Indra and I and our executive team were doing this and we had great support from our board. We had activist investors come into our stock, this is all public, who challenged the management team's focus for, and literally started to ask, were we thinking enough about the shareholder return versus doing the right thing? This was a public conversation. You can imagine reading the media news on a regular basis. I actually have a Business Week article with a picture of me and Indra on it which on the cover, on the, on the article, so it's a big picture of Indra and myself, it says Pepsi brings in the health police. And that was the first article written about me joining. So you can imagine this is, this is where this discussion was happening. It wasn't just in the boardroom. The reality is I would say a lot of credit to our board for supporting the mission, to Indra for having the courage to give me the air cover and having the talent in my organization to actually execute. And I think that balance can only happen if all of those things align. You need support from the board, you need support from the senior most or, or executives of the organization, including the business line managers, and then ultimately the ability to bring in the talent. In the long run, if PepsiCo is a good case study, we significantly outperform the market over and over and over again. And the only reason the activists left is because we perform better than anything that they were expecting. And so I think there is no, in my mind, conflict here. This whole self-interest versus doing the right thing, it's a short-term thing. If you can convince your stakeholders in the long run there's no conflict, which is what's ours, I don't think this is an issue. And frankly, let me, there is a war globally for STEM talent. This is not a nice to do. If we do not recruit every single person that we can bring into our organizations that has the talent, we're gonna be losing the competition because talent has places to go. And so diversity in every way is not only the right thing to do from a principal point of view, it's the right thing to do for business, commercially, talent-wise, in every other way. So, Dr. Khan, you have the last words and you bring us back to the way in which we started this on Monday, where we started with looking at the ways in which the stakeholder and the shareholder interests often coalesce. And they're not only not part, they're inconsistent, they're complementary, and create a business imperative that is also consistent with the moral imperative of diversity and inclusion. So with that, I want to thank all of you for seizing this moment. And this moment, as Martin Luther King said, a moment calls for leadership. And this moment at a time of a crisis of leadership in our nation, you are taking on that mantle of leadership to drive inclusion and diversity towards a more equal world. So thank you, Peter. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Thank you. Dr. Swami, and thank you, Dr. Kamachi, for being with us. And I declare this forum closed. Thank you.